started. So yes, welcome again to all of you. Uh, this webinar is one of the summer series of webinars uh, that we as Academia Unide, we organize. Um, and those webinars, those four webinars from Monday to Thursday, are all about the new imaginaries that we are trying to practice in these very hard times. So Academia Unide is a higher education institution uh, funded by the Fondazione Pistoletto, which is a contemporary art foundation in Italy, funded by uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto at the end of the 90s. And since the very core of Pistoletto Foundation is working on the connection between art and any other uh, branch of human cultures, Academia Unide works specifically on this connection and works specifically on sustainability and social transformation, or, or as we would say, a responsible social transformation. So we offer four main three years courses, one in art, one in design, one in new media, in, in, in media arts, and, and the last one in uh, fashion, fashion design, but all those courses are very focused on sustainability and social transformations. So for instance, the course in art is socially engaged art. The course in design is social innovation design. The one in media is new media and uh, social transformation. And the one in sustainability is sustainable fashion design. So this is really our core. And I'm really happy to uh, introduce you this uh, meeting, this uh, online talk that we do this night, uh, which has an interesting title, because we are trying to talk, to talk about a strange project, let's say, which is Europe. Uh, we can conceive Europe as a project somehow, a project with a lot of problems, uh, because, of course, we know that it was a big dream. It has been a big dream and probably it is still a big dream. And most of us, we try to practice to perform this dream. But we also know that we have many problems regarding Europe and regarding what we mean for Europe and how we can address the issue of making Europe. And actually, this pandemic was just at the very top of a, of a very long process of nationalization and of, uh, let's say, uh, discussing what a border is as well. So people could not cross borders. Or we all know the problems we had also with helping one state with another and the Europe itself for helping uh, states in recovering, in restarting. So in a way, Europe is a dream, but also a problem, a project, but also, uh, yeah, still a problem somehow, a project which did not succeed completely. Or yes, it succeeded to certain, regarding certain issues, but not regarding other issues. And uh, that's why we would really love to talk about engaging Europe. Also because we, uh, in Pistoletto Foundation, Academia Unide, we definitely think, as our director always says, that uh, Europe can be relevant for the world only if the world is relevant for Europe. So we're not gonna talk about uh, Europe as a sort of patriotical dream of building Europe as big continent, big image, a big project of something nationalistic, let's say, or neo-colonialistic somehow. Uh, but we are talking about Europe as a, something which can be relevant for the world, only if the world is relevant for Europe. And what we ask ourselves is, okay, but in this situation, uh, in this context, what art can do and what cultures can do about borders and what is a border nowadays and what is a territory as well. So when we talk about Europe, what can we say and how may we act? And this is why this uh, talk is promoted by the School of Social Innovation Design because Europe is, as I, as I said, a sort of a special project, let's say. So we will discuss this um, issue together with Catherine Watson and Paolo Naldini. 
uh, Catherine Watson, um, she's a very interesting, she has a very interesting curriculum. Uh, she's now at the moment, she, at the moment she's, a, she's a cultural leader in residence, we may say, at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And, uh, but before this, which is a very interesting uh, position, let's say, to discuss this issue, uh, but before this, she, she was also the former president of the ECF, the European Cultural Foundation. So somehow, Catherine has the, a long experience in uh, trying to uh, evolve the project of Europe from inside, let's say. And now the role that she has now, and also following the, this course in cultural leadership, um, is really uh, focused on how culture can make something, how culture can transform society. And together with Catherine, we also have Paolo Naldini, and he is the director of Pistoletto Foundation. And we decided to invite him to talk about Europe because uh, our art foundation is a foundation that works since many, many years uh, on Europe, let's say, from different points of view. So together with artists involved in residence, residencies program and helping them in developing their own ideas and projects and to engage their ideas and projects with the society. Uh, but also uh, with special projects connecting instit institutions. I can mention two or three projects, but just, just to give you an idea, I mean, one project was for instance, Octomans and Europeans, which was a project regarding the relation between the East, the Eastern culture and the Western culture in Europe within the same roof of Europe, let's say. And then other projects such as Trauma and Revival or uh, Next Generation, please, and a new project we, which will arrive like in the next months, all about, let's say, Europe from different perspectives. So the perspective of art, the, the perspective of education, and so on and so on. So in a way, uh, Paolo will help us in understanding how an institution such as uh, Pistoletto Foundation can act and again perform the dream of uh, no border uh, territory, let's say. And unfortunately, we do not have um, Dejan Kaludjerovic with us. He is an artist and he was supposed to be here uh, since he worked a lot uh, with the concept of uh, Europe and with a very interesting artwork uh, titled Europoli. Uh, but actually he couldn't come because he got sick and so he's really afraid of not being here. But anyway, we will manage, uh, manage anyway with Catherine and Paul. So uh, I don't want to add any other things. I guess we already have many elements. I also thank all the attendees here, present here. There are people from the Netherlands. I can see from the names that people from the ne Netherlands and from uh, Spanish speaking countries, Spanish pe speaking people as well. So I guess from many places in the world and uh, from Poland as well. So thank you for being here. And I will just uh, yeah, leave the stage to Catherine Watson. Um, since we really have a lot of to listen and to discuss together. Uh, thank you, Michaela, um, for both for the invitation to participate today and for the very kind introduction. It's really a pleasure to, to join you. I would like to begin with some thoughts on the title of the session, Engaging Europe, because I think if there was ever a time for Europe to engage, it's now, and most importantly, to engage collectively. Our understanding of engaging is really related to involvement, to participation, to connection, and engagement assumes a personal, intimate connection with others. Rules or terms of engagement are accepted. Uh, they're even written down with respect to peaceful and non-peaceful human interaction, whether it's in communities, businesses, international relations, human rights. And engaging Europe can be seen in two ways, I think. Firstly, um, to engage together and therefore define ourselves as Europeans 
beyond national borders and national identity, so the individual engaging with Europe. And secondly, in a closely knit European collective to engage with global challenges greater than ourselves. So that is engaging um, beyond Europe and engaging in solidarity and so a solidarity that's certainly greater than the nation states that we call home. So it's a very compelling title, I think. The first relates to the individual and considerations of identity, including the ability to simultaneously identify. So in my case, for instance, as a woman, mother, grandmother, an Amsterdamer, a Canadian, and a European. This sense of my sense of place, of home, is an intertwining of these relationships and my locality. I view, I relate to, and exchange, engage with the world from this intersecting perspective. And I would say that all of us do that. Thanks to, uh, thanks to the years that I worked with the European Cultural Foundation and its network, I cultivated and nurtured an understanding of Europe as I would often say, as an interdependent and intricate web of interlocal connections. Collect connections that don't know borders and present an opportunity to consider Europe beyond being a collection of nation states. A Europe of people, a Europe of communities and neighborhoods with a potential to achieve a Europe of solidarity. The European dream, I think, that you were talking about, Michaela. Um, the idea has certainly been facilitated by social media and by the free movement of people, goods and ideas around Europe. We could readily relocate, myself included. Millions of students benefited from study and work in another city, another country. International cultural projects, travel support and exchange opportunities certainly proliferated. Relatively affordable travel made cross-European adventure possible for millions of people. Airbnb allowed you to experience life like a local in other places. Interlocal connections were tangible. You only needed to look at the flight routes at any in-flight magazine to be able to visualize the scope and scale of the European and global movement of people. And then in 2022, everything changed. All of this very privileged movement, I might add, stopped overnight. Daily commutes, personal and professional connections were shattered. Convening and collective activity, whether educational, cultural, physical, spiritual, simply stopped. Everyone's space and identity was tied to the four walls that embraced them and the one, two, or a few people with whom they shared that space. Experiences, of course, varied across Europe, but what has been common is the rediscovery of local, the very, very, very local and the unavoidable reality that everything is now viewed from this rediscovered perspective. I think it's a true moment of thinking globally and acting locally because everyone is sharing in the same momentous happening and all the while experiencing it in a truly local specificity. I wouldn't say in the same boat to use that phrase by any means because the pandemic has not treated everyone equally but perhaps as many boats buffeted by the same storm. Despite the immediate and painful severing of connections, the imperative to physically distance and to seriously rethink the terms, practices, and rules of social engagement, our interdependence, connection to, and reliance on others has never been more clear. But the invisible, our connection is not necessarily more visible, but I do believe we can better understand and appreciate what is unseen and what has been unseen. We may be physically isolated and feeling alone, but we live and experience together. We've been compelled to return to our near neighborhood to get to know it on a very personal level, an engaged level, night and day, weekdays and weekends. The physical spaces that extend out from our space to beyond, windows and doors, balconies and front gardens, the piece of us that reaches out to others and opens up an interstitial space, a private space that has a collective echo. These are physical boundaries and spaces that have long been metaphors to help make tangible what is unseen. Think of Mahatma Gandhi's famous quote, I don't want my house to be walled in on all sides and my windows to be stuffed. I want the culture of all lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible. 
We've seen the countless balcony concerts and parties, collective moments of appreciation spilling out onto streets that are no longer the sole purview of vehicles, or the reclaiming of the front garden, hitherto considered as a buffer between the home and street, like a moat. Spaces to plant, to grow, and chat across the fence. In between spaces, connecting spaces that have re been reimagined and repurposed into collective spaces. So what happens in the spaces in between? What are the conditions and ingredients that enable connection and engagement? Empathy is the ground on which interlocality flourishes. Empathy starts with each and every one of us and then, then ripples out, gains strength. As Richard Sennett points out, it is one of the key ingredients for, as he says, complex cooperation or togetherness. It is a human nature and a human skill that is learned and can be nurtured Unfortunately, it can also be suppressed, crushed, and unlearned. I, for one, am hopeful that these strange times in which we're living will show that empathy will overcome its foes. In a recent interview with The Guardian newspaper on the 13th of this month, Naomi Klein spoke of, quote, the softness that the pandemic has introduced into our culture. When you slow down, you can feel things. When you're, in, when you're in that constant rat race, it doesn't leave much time for empathy. From its very beginning, the virus has forced us to think about interdependencies and relationships. So how do we picture the interlocal in this consideration of all of us moving into a very local uh, reality? I didn't include any images in the presentation because I do think it's impossible to illustrate what's unseen without fixing a rather narrow definition. Nevertheless, I'm sure everyone can conjure up in your own mind and from your own personal experiences an image that um, depicts this connection. I'm reminded of a compelling project in 2018 in South Africa, commemorating what would have been Nelson Mandela's 100th birthday. Hundreds of community groups came together in schools, human rights organizations, prisons, children, the elderly, to knit blankets. These individual blankets were sewn together in the world's largest collective quilt, depicting Mandela's face framed by the South African flag. The finished quilt, as they said, the largest ever, is only fully visible from the air, which is how we need to imagine our own peace in contributing to society wider, greater, stronger, and warmer than our own corner and tightly knit together with the others. Or open up the interactive map on Chiche del Arte's Geographies of Change project and then drill down ever finer and finer until you reach a local initiative in the hills of Piemonte, perhaps small in size, but not in its contribution to collective impact when you consider it alongside all of the other change-making initiatives in this global mapping and the interlocal community that it represents, since the mapping is, after all, user-generated. The European Cultural Foundation has opened several calls for ideas, convened idea camps for idea makers, and awarded research and development grants to boost some of these ideas from dream to reality. The process recognized that necessary change happens first at a personal level, that individuals are motivated to act, to build collectives, are inspired to create and to respond to challenges and injustices together. ECF invited applications for ideas from anyone or any group who were determined to make change and address global issues, perhaps such as the contraction and enclosure of public space, or the practice of commenting, or the moving and changing communities as a result of the forced migration of people. The DIY, do-it-yourself philosophy was enriched by a do-it-with-others imperative. Connecting local ideas that are responding to challenges that are bigger than their locality, that can only be addressed with local specificity, sharing and amplifying their stories describes and presents the interlocal. Consider the many local manifestations after the killing of George Floyd in America simultaneously shining a light on local experiences and illuminating the global problem of inequality and racism. Enough is enough. Interconnected thinking expressed in local action. Black Lives Matter is a collective response, a global movement acted out locally. These, these times, the times we're in, evidence 
an acceleration moment for such movements, catalyzed by very personal and local experience. The term social media really has a newfound relevance in the times of social distan distancing, which I think is perhaps better described as physical distancing. Our social is maintained, we're just physically not together. It ha has a social media has allowed us to keep connected over distance. It has facilitated education, social and cultural shared experiences. And as it always has, it has brought us the news. I'm sure that we now look at the information we receive differently and perhaps, perhaps have a better understanding of our connection to what is happening in another place. Empathize with others, acknowledge our relationships to others, recognize our interdependence. Journalists report from their kitchen table. This panel is coming from three different locations. We come to know the pictures on the walls, the books on the shelves, the personality, the humanness, the very local experience and perspective. Think of the weather reports. Many of us watch the weather with insatiable curiosity. It's a topic of uh, conversation everywhere. We see not only the individual temperature, precipitation, wind and sunshine in the individual cities, but also the air streams, flows, currents across continents and oceans. Are we becoming better at looking at the connections between the influences, the movement, the interdependencies across time and space and thinking about what is happening somewhere else in its relation to us, what is happening in another town, another home, especially when we cannot physically go there. There have been many considerations of how good practices on a local level can be scaled up. If good things are happening locally, how can we make it bigger? Can it be replicated on a larger scale? However, I don't think it's a question of scaling up, a vertical movement from grassroots or local to regional to national to European to global, but rather a scaling out horizontally, interlocality that maintains a local specificity and recognizes local difference, and in this addresses wider human challenges. Scaling out is evident in acceleration or amplification moments, events that move us to greater togetherness. And of course, we can't forget that these events can also exacerbate greater difference and greater division. Global crisis, crises have been these kinds of moments. We're not even a quarter through the 21st century and we've lived the financial and economic crisis of 2008, the forced migration crisis that reached its height in 2015 and continues, and now the coronavirus pandemic. These are ongoing crises that have tremendous human costs and that have changed our world dramatically. Increasingly though, our, our collective response reflects and defines our interdependence and our interlocality. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It was super dense and super inspiring at the same moment, at the same time. So thank you a lot. You're welcome. I, I already have many, many things to say actually, but I would love to wait for Paul first. Thank Paolo, you, Michele. Maybe, thank you. Wow, it's been really an amazing piece. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. And I can really find a lot of re resonances in your talk and your concerns. Uh, of course, um, I think that if we were born in a polytheistic culture and not in a monotheistic culture, it would be much easier for all of us to uh, let ourselves be understood. Uh, because what we're mostly and basically talking about here is uh, the, the coexistence of uh, um, the other, of dualities. Uh, it's not just uh, the idea of the synthesis, which uh, in the Hegelian or dialectic form would bring a third element out of two existing ones. It is not just that because we are talking of uh, keeping the initial two existing elements together in the picture. So we are saying that we create a third element, an interlocal, interdependent, intertwined, intersected third element, but we don't get rid of the one 
that we started from, from the locales that were not at the beginning interdependent uh, in themselves. This is a major difference because it, it, it means that um, our history doesn't simply, um, uh, how do you say, uh, proceed by uh, deleting the past, but keeping the past and reshuffling it with a, a new, with a new, which means creating. So basically, we are following a creation a formula. If I can quote Pistoletto, uh, the formula of creation that brings together two things, but creates a third thing, but keeps the, the, the first and the second as well. And so I would like to tackle this by uh, again resorting to a new word, creating a new word, most times uh, naming and creating names is a, a good help in advancing in our quest into the known and the unknown. So let me uh, venture into the uh, into the the world of uh, three circularity. Three circularity. So uh, many of us are pretty familiar with the hype of a circular of the circular, the circular economy, first of all, of course, but the very idea of circular itself. And um, we, we are told uh, that we are going, or we should go from the linear model to the circular one, and that entailing that we should uh, be able to um, close the circle uh, of our own existence, or our, of our own presence in our ecologies, and of course, economy. And that sounds like uh, um, a graal, uh, uh, a holy graal for uh, uh, finding a new uh, relationship with the planet. But again, our monotheistic culture brings us to look at this paradigm, uh, forgetting about uh, the pre-existing ones. Uh, so let's focus for a minute on uh, uh, the linear paradigm and where it brought us uh, in terms of scaling up. And I love the expression scaling out, which I'm going to quote uh, again. Uh, uh, where did it bring us? It brought us to different kinds uh, and colors uh, of imperialism. So a mondialization or a globalization uh, that was mostly depending on the idea that we would uh, in, impinge on the world our circular area. So we would circulate around the whole world with our own model of uh, uh, appropriation. Uh, now we're talking about uh, circularity and we, we usually refer it to a specific locality or a, a supply chain uh, uh, specifically uh, individuated. But what is uh, the uh, likely outcome of uh, uh, the um, quest or indulging into the circular model if it is to be taken by its own sake its own, its own uh, uh, monotheistic value is going to grow. We will widen the diameter of our circle. And at the beginning, it's going to be our neighborhood or even maybe our house. Then it will grow into our region. It will grow into our nation still. Then it will grow into a coalition of nations or a federation. And then it will, it will grow into the world. So basically, we will uh, end up circling uh, or fencing up uh, uh, walls around ourselves in a wider and wider scale. That would be, again, uh, the application of our Western culture um, paradigm of uh, uh, 
uh, monotheistic approach. Whereas it would be that easy because already we were presented with this idea in the past by many cultures uh, around the world to confront the circular model with something else again with the else but if the if the linear was not our favorite one it could be enough to uh, consider another circular uh, model so we would have two circular cycles or two circular models uh, side by side one with another uh, and so we're beginning to picture something that perhaps correct me if i'm wrong uh, can be associated with the idea of interlocality but again uh, the duality uh, might generate in its uh, um, connected in between space a notion that both of you have mentioned and that Homi Baba uh, has uh, extensively discussed upon this membrane um, connecting or dividing the two circles both enjoying a circularity in its own self this membrane might uh, uh, possess a quality that might really allow us to uh, find what we're looking for but it is to get out of the prison whatever prison it is even the circular prison and how would we then be able we will we be able to explore this uh, space between two circular economies for example the pianura padana one and uh, the Pro province french provence one for example and the outs are in between are we going to be able to explore a third membranic element and generate a whole system that does not simply provide a, for a new circle but adds up a third circle in a, a organic connection with the two existing ones and therefore the third circle and therefore perhaps giving giving birth to a three circular not a b circular or bi circular but a three circular uh, ecology and that in mind the growth that we might expect if we want to use this bad word uh, again in history is would not uh, provide us with a uh, imperialistic model but now i want to be provocative a pandemic one that would see the uh, diffusion of the thousands of the three circularities and each one potentially enjoying a tricircular relation with another circularity or tricircularity so for extending to the global net of the uh, of, of the planet an approach that uh, uh, nurtures a polytheistic a poly cultural uh, uh, vision and uh, applying all this to Europe uh, I think that uh, uh, we have seen interlocality happening in many uh, networks for example of cities uh, and we have seen uh, agenda 21 um, for example or, or others um, how much more effective can they be but again, if I consider the city as a paradigm, am I, am I to forget the other two paradigms that are part of this three circular equ equation? The opposite paradigms where the, where the city can be in between. And the opposite are 
the, the immediate paradigm of the individual. We all are individuals. We, we can not agree with Mrs. Thatcher's idea that society is only a, a, a group of individuals, but still we cannot even deny our being also individuals. I know that we can become individuals, for, for example, but still our being in individuality uh, is uh, something we should not, I believe, uh, forget or deny or try to delete. But we could put into the equation. And, and on the other hand, therefore, we could even accept and engage with Europe, which is a, a total, totalistic uh, identity abstraction. Uh, and so what would be in the middle? In this empty space between these two gigantic paradigms that humanity in most places has nurtured in, in history, what can be in the middle? Uh, if the middle has to prove as a generator, it has, to be, it has to be void, it has to be empty. So if you put something in there, you will en enjoy another uh, dynamic. But if you are talking about the dynamic of uh, creating, you should preserve the empty the void because the void is the most uh, welcoming ev the welcoming element in the universe what does it mean to have the void between europe and the individual and i finish and i conclude but i would like to to quote uh, uh, to mention this uh, this uh, other element of human uh, coming together uh, and not only humans of course but which is uh, what I would really see as the constituted element of our societies in respect with both paradigms of individuals and the, uh, the, and the global, even the uh, more, um, sovereign national, like, like Europe, for example. It is where we spend most of our time and identity in. It is our community of practice. It is what we do where we do, how we do, with whom do we do it, which is uh, actually occurring to most of us for the most of our life, for the most of our time. We go to work, we go to a vocational place, we live in a, in a vocational place like our um, family. All and each of these are ecologies of practice where we can negotiate and practice our multi-dependent, intertwined, and I would say tricircular identity, where there we can actually, in the practical, so if I am uh, a nurse, I would then uh, bring all this ecology of thought into my daily life in, uh, in, in, in the hospital, where I work with my colleagues, and with, with the doctors and the patients in that exact specific building, in that exact specific uh, time uh, uh, individuated uh, uh, neighborhood. If I manage to bring and convey that uh, the dynamics of uh, relationship between my being individual, my being European, within my being practically, exercising my identity with my, as I said, colleagues and supporters, so like even non-humans, I think we might there uh, nurture a new paradigm that I would like to call it tricircular in homage to Pistoletto's vision. Uh, so I think I wanted to connect to, to, to Catherine's amazing uh, talk and, and notions of uh, scaling up and scaling out and interlocality uh by referring to also my my own experience in Tito Larsen. Thank you. This evening is quite difficult because like both of you you gave a super impressive talk, a super impressive speech, and it's not that easy to uh bring the 
the wires, let's say, of the conversation. Anyway, I really would love to, and of course, if any from the attendees want to ask something, please use the tool of the Q&A. Uh, but I was taking some notes and I also want to ask you something because um, in my opinion, uh, there is a, something we really have to try to understand when we talk about interlocality, uh, which is the, of course, the local development and the regional development. So uh, in Europe, we have a long story regarding the local development, uh, mostly connected to the 90s. And of course, there are a lot of academics also who worked on the idea of a local development, starting from Michael Porter or Giacomo Beccatini or others, but also, of course, the concept of capabilities by Amatya Sen, which was so important to define if the local was enough, able to allow people to build their own life, let's say. Um, but at the same moment with the idea of the local, um, also have some problems, uh, as, uh, as we all know, and somehow, because of course, if you work too much on the local, then it, it, it's really, uh, the risk is that you concentrate too much on the local and you miss uh, the global. And that's why we, many times we say we have to act local, but to think global. Um, and that's true. This, this is a story that we know. But what I feel at the moment is that we, uh, we live a different idea of local as well. Uh, mostly because of the digital connection. So in a way, like the digital connection define a completely different territory uh, and the local is something else somehow. So my question is about the interlocality, not about the local, of course, because we are talking about interlocality. So what do you think, like within this concept of uh, local as a place, which has an, an, it's a non-place somehow, uh, because it's a place, of course, it's a physical place. The local is always a physical place, but just because of the medial connection, the digital connection, uh, then there is a different geographies, which is a completely different uh, borders and extents. So, so what is the interlocality within this situation? Uh, because the digital is not the in between; it's the real territory actually so this this is the first the first question uh that i have for you and then uh the second um question is about borders uh sometimes we when we talk about borders and boundaries of course uh we we have to come back to the latin and to know that borders in latin and uh, there are two words to say border in latin one is limes and the other one is limen with n so when limes is a barrier, is something that ends, no? And instead, a limen is a threshold. So the idea of the in-between of Omibaba is much closer to the one of the limen more than the one of the limens. And I will also say that, uh, yes, Europe itself, the idea of Europe itself was really trying to, uh, let's say, transform the idea of a border, of a border escape, let's say, uh, to an idea, the idea of the threshold, so something that you can really trespass and to work with. So this empty space, uh, as Paolo was mentioning. Anyway, at the same moment, uh, I feel again like the situation, the condition of each of us as individual and also as co-individuals or as a collective, let's say, is very much about uh, migration. Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Nail says that we leave the condition of the migrant. It's an existential condition. It's not something which, I mean, is, is a definition only for the people who is moving from one place to another, but that we live as humans, we live a condition of the migrant. It's part of us. We feel ourselves like in movement. So how do you, how do we, cope with this? How can we work with the in-between space, with the interlocality, if the condition of the individuals is much more the condition of movement, of mobility, of migration? So yes, so, so, so I know that there are very big questions, but just to open up the discussion. So 
I think, um, well, first off, I'd, I'd like to say that digital certainly enables um, or is one of, uh, enables interlocality for sure, because it's not just the ability for us to talk to each other, but it's the, the, and the movement of ideas, right? Um, I think uh, awareness also does that, but it, it, interlocality is not simply about uh, the ability to move from one place to another and for physically to interact or intersect. And I think that what the, this current situation we've had, which has forced us not to be able to do that, has us look at what are the things actually that connect us beyond the ability to physically, to physically connect. Um, I think a mobility, as you, you said, has, it is uh, the digital world and our connectivity there and the huge mobility um, on this planet has changed everything, whether that's mobility by, uh, by choice or whether it's forced mobility. The, this, this planet is in motion. Not only is it in motion in its own, uh, 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 in its own daily and yearly uh, movement around the sun, it is in motion in, inside it. So for, for me, this, this is then this sense of how we observe and understand that. And I think one of the things is that really interests me is to not, in thinking of, of, of network or thinking of connectivity or uh, interlocality and connection of things, international, intercity, you talked about the cities network. It's not so much to think about the spaces that are being connected, but what is it that makes the connection. And it would be too simplistic to say that it's uh, 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 just digital, although digital enables it, or the ability to move, or the interest, or the curiosity, or the um, intercultural nature, any of that. It's, I think it's, it's uh, this time is showing us, and we have to figure out what it is in, in order to do a better job of, um, ensuring that that happens, that it is that level that people connect. And no much, how much we try or expect that if we take the vertical, the, 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 the monolithic, as you said, Paolo, and you take the top of that, so the nation states coming together to try and do things together or, or um, work things out. We've seen that recently in uh, in the EU around the recovery packages that are being being discussed. It's a different conversation that you have when you bring together the top of uh, a linear a scaling up than if you bring together even uh, um, only almost metaphorically, when you bring together the base of that. So that was the, con the idea that I was trying to talk about, about horizontality. In, in a way, what, how, how do you describe what it is? I think part of it is, uh, as I was talking about with, with empathy and taking time to think and reflect and see what one's responsibility is as an individual, what one's responsibility is in that near community that you've got wherever it is and how that relates by taking that responsibility to being able to address much larger, larger things. You know, I mean, the, 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 the forced, um, the regulations around how we would act or how we are acting in our different places because it varies place to place has, I think, pushed people to think about how they are together otherwise, you know, how you, how you do everything in a different way. And the more that we can think about or break down a lot of these vertical um, structures and power relationships that are come out of them into a more uh, horizontal and horizontal in thinking as much as in horizontal in, in action, that the ability to, um, to address challenges, whether they're environmental, whether they're 
uh, social injustices, whether it's um, racial injust any injustice, anything that is so big that way and cannot be, has to be handled by all of us. <laughs> But as what I try to say, the, the relevance to understanding a local specificity in, in, um, in any conversation. And that's not about building a wall around the local. It's around how in that, the, the various things that come together in that specificity, do you need to uh, address something, whether it's uh, environmental considerations or any number of things. Yeah, uh, I would like to comment upon this uh, question of you, of yours. Uh, I think that, to put it bluntly, basically the problem is uh, democracy. Yeah, um, democracy as we know it, of course, Churchill and many others said that is the less worst. Uh, system we have, uh, rightly so, but the, the real problem that I want to focus upon with democracy now is, uh, is it being uh, election-based? So it's the, the question of voting. And the election system has two main problems. One, it is uh, the delegation that it uh, uh, brings along, and the other is it's been territorial, territorially based. The, the easy one is the, the second. It is territorially based. So it is definitely very reasonable for Mr. Uh, Rutte uh, in the Netherlands to um, complain or to be, to represent a certain vision because it's a vision mostly present in the territory where his election um, domain is located. Same wise for countries like, uh, for, 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 for country leaders like, like Conte, who have to rely their power on an election system where whose uh, um, value board or value system is uh, uh, territorially defined. So this being territorial, uh, limited or specified, uh, specific, uh, brings along a, a gigantic uh, problem that, that only can be uh, faced with uh, with the logic of strength uh, or with the logic of diplomacy. Uh, and that's, that's always been like that in history, we know it very well. But now, uh, since I said at the, in the earlier part, part of my uh, contribution uh, that I wouldn't get rid of anything, but I would try to, to work with everything in a creative way, uh, what would I, would I uh, um, evoke? I would like to, to, to uh, focus on the, the, the issue of power. Uh, so as I said, uh, power is distributed in democracy, uh, or at least that's, that's the most common and naive and, and trivial understanding. Uh, it's distributed uh, through uh, the election system. Uh, but is it really like that? If, if we think of it, is it really true that power only and mostly resides in the rooms, in the parliament and the government rooms? Is it not perhaps the opposite that every, again, ecology of practice, every organization, is a microgovernment has got a tremendous power to impact on its inhabitants' lives. If we are to 
become aware of this, uh, which is one of the most trivial, and, uh, but also hidden and considerations uh, of, of the social reality, we then might begin to conceive uh, the power is also elsewhere, as I said, but also democracy can be perfectioned. And the uh, election and vote system can be associated with other uh, ecologies of uh, power exercise uh, where we can engage. So if I again, again go back to the local, in, in the uh, intra-local, meaning the organizational, organizational is what constitutes the, the local, it, then I can associate that with the, uh, let's call it global for a moment, meaning the, the national government, the regional government, even the county, the town council government, uh, parliament or government, uh, both. Uh, and then I can uh, uh, begin to uh, reshuffle my understanding, my view of uh, uh, place making, of life making, uh, uh, of uh, owning uh, public and, and private spheres of life. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, that has got a lot to do with what we talked about before. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention the digital uh, in this, uh, but uh, maybe it would take too too long if I was to put everything together. I think I um, find I think you're you're looking at organ or or considering that an organization or a smaller unit. Um, might be a place where things could act differently. And that's true. But I think, unfortunately, what we have now is most situations mimic the larger uh, or the, 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 the superstructure, as it, it, as it were. So it's, I would say it's not, and so you have this hierarchy, this um, distribution of power that is unreasonable and this inability to bring others into leadership, the understanding that leadership only is by somebody at the top. Um, and, and, and that is a power relation. If it's between two people, if it's between 20 people, 2,000 people, 2 million people. So the, the way that we need, I think, to look at democracy is not through the political system in the lens but to say it is a system that if we have everyday democracy and understand that at its roots if we are involving and to use the word engaging everyone is engaged with that committed to um, the the collective and um, finds ways to, uh, or, or we find ways to facilitate um, looking at things not from a hierarchical way and, and more from a horizontal way, more from, I mean, if, if, if you're constantly focused on these structures like that and working in a, in, in a certain way, you miss so much. If you're, you see much more from the edge than you see from the center of something. You, uh, and how do we position ourselves in a way to be looking at whole pictures instead of this, this narrow view, in which generally is a, a vertical hierarchical one. And I think is the worst example of it is the political systems that we've got. And unfortunately, we call it democracy and then it gets brought back that, well, we voted in the people that are there, right? But that's because we leave democracy to only one thing, which is voting. And voting itself, except in very few situations, does not involve everyone or even a significant percentage of the citizenry. And I talk about citizens as the people who are you know, living, contributing in a space, not necessarily having a piece of paper to say they are a citizen of X country or, or, or Y country. Um, so it, it, we, 
we miss so much in that. So we're caught by a system that certainly we've built um, and over generations have honed it in its imper imperfection. Um, but yeah, if we could, if there were ways to open that up where it, it doesn't uh, uh, fall into a very oppositional situation, which we see most of the time in, in party politics, where there are two or three major parties, it, there's, there's often more flexibility that way in, uh, in European situations, say, than in, in, in North America. But um, where one has a choice with who one votes for, we won't even go into situations where there isn't a choice. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, I, there's something to be said for everyday democracy is, is how do we nurture uh, in people, the, a sense of civics, a sense of responsibility, a sense of engagement, and that we find ways to actually, uh, Churchill may have said it's the, 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 democracy may not be fantastic, but it's the best we've got. Everything can be better, you know? And I, I think um, one of the big challenges with the consideration of Europe is there's an awful lot, the system could be so much better the structure could be so much better, but it has modeled itself on just a supra sort of a concept. And it's a supra concept that says we will be, um, uh, we will be collaborative because everyone, you know, each of the member states has to uh, agree on whatever it is that we're agreeing on. And then you bring together, you know, a gaggle of particular perspectives rather than this is something bigger than ourselves. So what I was talking about, about bigger than self, you know, it, it does start with the individual. So something that is bigger than me and bigger than my uh, community and bigger than my town, bigger than my city, bigger than, it, it's the, there are huge things that we need to uh, be able to um, address as humanity. So, yeah, and, and I think we may well do that best in, in breaking it down, but that does into smaller pieces, but that doesn't mean that we disintegrate something. Those <clears throat> smaller pieces can be a much stronger whole than uh, something that says you are whole <laughs> and it's all disparate than growing up and saying, no, we are a whole. There was my comment about in the whole idea of engaging Europe first have to decide as an individual, regardless of where you sit geographically, that the idea of Europe is something that you say, so uh, that, that you believe in. And the other is the ability then for that whole collectivity that is Europe to act together in solidarity. So it's, it, it's I think, uh, I mean, some would say dreaming and others might say utopic, but uh, I think there are things that, that we have in our humanity that are worth fixing, not necessarily throwing out. Yeah, that's exactly the point. That's probably the main reason why I wanted to uh, change the world uh, from democ democracy to democracy. That it means that I kept the demos and I wanted to focus on the idea of power and the power of the demos uh, uh, in my view relies on uh, being uh, engaged practically in your neighborhood in your community uh, and aware that that's where you are being an active citizen but since i'm trying to be polytheistic or tricircular i don't want to get rid of uh, what keeps Mr. Conte and Mr. Rutte up there, which is the democratic uh, territorial for the moment, uh, country related uh, system. It can change. We can very well go to the European wide elections, meaning that I can vote for Mr. Rutte and you can vote for Mr. Conte, for example. Uh, and that would bring along uh, a scaling up, but not a scaling out of uh, the, 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 the approach. 
Uh, but I knew, Catherine, that uh, you had very uh, strong ideas on uh, Europe, uh, and it's been a, a possible utopia for us. And, and I do agree, but as, uh, as Michele mentioned, I think that the, it can only work in that way if uh, it can be dreamt of not only by Europeans. I also would love to read two questions, which are questions, but also, let's say, considerations. The first one was, is by Pavel uh, Bogutitsky, um, and he says, I agree with the saying that Europe can be only relevant for the world if the world is, is relevant for Europe. What always uh, worries me is that the discourse on Europe is primarily rather Eurocentric, dealing with almost only inter-European topics and issues. There is little progressive thought and action coming from Europe, from European artists, intellectuals and educators addressing contemporary challenges, for instance, in the global south, which I claim faces way larger problems than Europe itself. Yet, maybe in avoidance of neocolonialism, the upscaling of interlocal European <clears throat> to interlocal global discourse, which Catherine spoke about, remains to be very difficult and problematic. Perhaps we indeed need the dynamics of the three secularity, as Paolo says, or Pistoletto's third paradise, to really make it work. And so thank you, Pavel. And then also another comment by Kuhn Kivitz. Uh, he says, um, I was wondering if finding a synthesis or a third cycle between the physical and the digital localities can maybe work as a way of strengthening the capabilities of both to connect us. And I also want to add a reflection to what you said before, uh, because w w while you were speaking, I was uh, thinking about, of course, democracy and Alexis de Tocqueville, that is like the father of everything, like let's say the contemporary democracy. And he was, when he wrote the, this fabulous book, The, Democ the Democracy in America, uh, he was, he used to say that the health of a democratic society um, is actually can be measured uh, by the quality of um, the functions, he was saying functions, uh, but the, the point is the quality of the functions performed by the individuals, by the private citizens. So in the very first idea of democracy by Alexis de Tocqueville, that of course it was an ethno ethnographer, a political ethno ethnographer <coughs> studying democracy in America in a completely different century. But it, it's quite interesting that actually the idea we came out like in these centuries was really that, like that we can, uh, let's say, measure, evaluate the healthiness, the health of a democratic system, starting from the function performed, which is interesting, but the point is that it's the function performed by private citizens. So this idea, we, we are like, it, it's part of us and it, it's really difficult. I mean, at, at a certain point, I can say, yes, we have to work together. We, I mean, we have to act and perform together as an organization. But from the other side, I, I can also say, yes, a democracy we live now, it's really, uh, I mean, this uh, inherited, this idea of private citizen performing. So like voting, which is problematic as, as you said very well, but voting is only one of, uh, let's say the consequences of, of this idea of a democracy which which is performed only by individuals, by private citizens. But it's interesting that Tocqueville was saying exactly this thing. So it's like, this is the idea of democracy we embody. And, but yes, at the same time, I was also thinking about Karl Polanyi, which was a fabulous uh, economy, yeah, economist and sociologist and philosopher and many other things. And he was really uh, envisioning 
uh, the idea of uh, economy, ec economy and society and politics, which is uh, embodied in, in a whole. So the embeddedness, so this idea of embeddedness as a way for making a synthesis is something, and he was really speaking about a, yeah, a, a way of making an econom a, a making economy through society and through politics. So very, very connected. So I, I still think that this idea was still a very powerful idea, which can could really allow Europe, but not only Europe, to 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 pass from the idea of the Tocqueville of private citizen performing to the idea of organizations performing. But I, I don't know. This is this is my opinion actually. I, I I do think that does echo the the, um, the idea of, of an everyday democracy and a responsibility that individuals have in within the collective. I, mean, I think what we're experiencing now is kind of an, almost an out of body situation where political systems are not at all anything related you know they, they're they're um they're not a a function or a uh, embedded in who we are as a, a society as a civilization they're kind of like a structure that lives on its own so how, how do you bring those two together or maybe it's needs a new system all, or a structure altogether but they're yeah, they, um, the, the political system lives for its own system. I wouldn't say individuals necessarily within it, uh, but the system lives for its, uh, or, or, or continues for its own existence. It's a self-perpetuating kind of thing, rather than being a reflection of the engagement of the citizens within it, right? Or people within it, that's not, um, fixate on citizens but uh, and the other I wanted to um, um, mention the, the this notion of Europe in the world and I mean Europe could work on itself and become very strong and solid and solid and have a lot of solidarity but if it's still closed to use the metaphor that's often used and a fortress then it's just become a larger, it, it, it's just become a, 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 a super nation, which we realize for many reasons, it's probably not going to happen. But this sense of where you close your borders down, right? So it, it, it can't, it itself can't close down, which is why I think it's quite compelling to think about interlocality that actually cuts across. Um, and interlocality is also interlocality in an urban space, you know, one neighborhood to another. So it, it, it cuts across all of those, as you'd said, Paolo, those uh, the, to move the linear into a circle or an enclosure, all of those enclosures that tightly enclose maybe larger and larger spaces uh, from a colonial perspective. But it, um, yeah, how, how can we, uh, we, we move away from that? or the, the tendency towards that. And I think it is um, looking or, or supporting though the individual acts or acknowledging the individual acts, their contribution to, and seeing what collective impact is when, when, you, when you line all of these things up or when all of these things, uh, when you step back and have a look and you can see how what's connecting or you can't necessarily visualize what's connected but you see the connections between many different uh, nodes Paolo, do you want to add some final comments maybe well perhaps uh, another uh, name or definition that might be useful in uh, featuring this uh, uh, multi-layered and uh, dimension of uh, the democracy uh, might be uh, the one by um, uh, uh, by um, 
the name of the, the uh, Apadurai, uh, Aryun Apadurai, who talks about uh, a deep democracy, deep democracy, uh, therefore implying that there is a, a superficial one or, or, a, or an epid epidermic one uh, or a more visible one. No? So, uh, and the deep uh, democracy uh, has a lot to do with the, the performing and the performance that, um, that, we, can, that we can enact. Uh, of course, it might be uh, more, uh, even more impactful if we, if at, the, this, at this depth, uh, we identify clusters, and therefore that's why I, I keep visualizing organizations. Uh, but uh, again, I, I would contradict myself a lot if I would not uh, in involve, if not even instigate, the individuality within organizations. Uh, but then, it's very true, uh, a remark by Catherine, uh, that uh, an organization per se can be very evil, or can be very, uh, on the contrary, very, very, very generative and, 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 and ethic, ethical. Uh, therefore, I don't think that uh, by itself, uh, this model or this paradigm brings al along the good, not the bad, uh, which is probably something we're going to have to negotiate with anyway, wherever and whenever we, uh, we, are, we are as humans, we carry it along with ourselves. Uh, but um, um, which, which th this refers to the uh, hierarchy that uh, organizations can uh, um, perform or uh, the horizontality that they can bring in. Um, and of course, we have wonderful examples of worst examples of both, of both paradigms. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, nurture methodologies, experimentation of uh, this quest into other depths of democracy, uh, allowing, acknowledging, or allowing, as I was lapsing in saying, that uh, uh, the, the vote system is going to stay until we have something totally better, which I don't think is likely to happen. Uh, quickly, uh, but performing these, uh, the democracy at different depths, uh, developing methodologies from artists. And as artists, we have seen and practiced uh, some uh, and daily art collectives perform new uh, iterations um, of, of such quest uh, an exploration. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with the, the last word I would like to call upon is uh, the idea of the rituals. Uh, in our uh, imminent life, uh, we are um, uh, losing the um, proximity and the familiarity with rituals. Uh, we substitute some some of them with uh, daily trivial uh, sometimes sublime rituals often associated with nature for example uh, but most of the times we don't realize that that's what we're doing that it, we are uh, performing rituals uh, and wherever a ritual happens uh, it means that latent there is a myth, uh, there is a vision, a Weltanschauung, uh, that uh, wants to be shared, but cannot be shared or didn't, wasn't not chosen to be shared by language with words, but with another more complex performance. Uh, so I think that we can. Um, engage in a 
proliferation uh, and experimentation of rituals of deep democracy. Uh, that democracy or, or many other forms of being political uh, animals. Thank you a lot. I guess we really have a lot of things to think about <laughs> and to work on, of course, since what I what I felt today is that most of the ideas are very operative ideas. And so it's it's quite interesting, like it's a, a discursive, m m most of them there were discursive formations that Foucault will say. So both you, Catherine, and you, Paolo, you, you really gave us strong tools to uh, understand the reality and to perform something different. So yes, thank you to you both for being here and also for all the people who attended to the meeting. Um, the meeting would be, it's recorded and it would be available online very soon in our social network and in our website. Uh, which is academiaunide.it and uh, yes I, I, I guess we really came to the end of uh, the talk of today tomorrow we will have another talk uh, which will be about performing slow fashion it's quite interesting uh, with Kate Fletcher from the Goldsmith University no from, sorry the, the Royal Academy of Arts in London and um, Elisa van Jolen uh, she's a fashion designer, artist and fashion designer, Italian and Dutch, and with Maria Teresa Pisani from the UN, the Economic Committee of the UN. So it will be the last uh, webinar of this uh, webinar summer series. Um, and so thank you for coming. And I really hope we can meet very soon with Catherine. We discussed a lot, always, always online, but I, I really hope we can meet in presence very soon. And thank you, Paolo, and see you next time. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michele. Thank you, Catherine. See you soon.